Good morning, everybody. I've had too much time to work on this lesson. I've changed it at least four times. I figured, well, I'll start on Monday, you know, make sure that I get it good and solid. And then Tuesday, bing, I have this epiphany, and I'm back at it. So there I was thinking, at last, I've got it. I'm sitting in the back, and then Dan comes up here and says, ding, 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 all these lights going off. I said, no, stop, John, stop. That was a good encouragement, Dan. So this uh, morning, um, I would say that if you've been in Christ for a while, you've wondered what God has in mind for you. I've been wondering that for a long time. Yep. What has he got in mind for us in the life that we're living now? And maybe you've had some daydreams about doing some great stuff for the Lord. Uh, but somehow it just doesn't seem to come to pass. The Old Testament has many stories of those that have overcome great adversity and enjoyed great success. But what about now? So I've, I put a little asterisk next to this next little paragraph because I've decided this is probably the theme of this morning's message. I have come to believe that all of us are presented with opportunities to make choices that will bring glory to God, and even though it may not seem like much at the time, the cumulative effect of many small daily choices has a very large impact for the glory of God. Keep that in mind. Many small daily choices that you make, because you can make a choice for good or bad. I've decided I'm going to get angry because this guy just cut me off, or I'm going to not get angry and assume that he's on the way to see his dying mother in the hospital. It's all about choices. You can let things affect you positively or negatively. You can assume the worst in people or not. <clears throat> so with that thought in mind, I thought we'd take a couple of moments this morning to consider a young woman, Esther, who came to a crossroads in her life and had to make a choice. It was not a routine choice, and yes, it impacted uh, the saving of the Jewish people throughout the land. Remember, uh, she had some pretty humble beginnings. She was a young orphan girl. Her nation was enslaved to another. Mother and father both dead. Cousin by the name of Mordecai was raising her as his own daughter. Young girl was quickly elevated to the position of the queen of over 125 provinces. And then she's called upon to plead the case of the Jews to the king knowing that it may cost her her life. And she may have been a little hesitant to do so, so Mordecai reminds her in Esther 4.14, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from, for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is our time. This is our time. Are we getting the most out of it that we can? Not that we need worldly accomplishments, but what about spiritual accomplishments? Are we making any progress? Or have we decided that we are too little and too small to make any significant change in our time? Or have we come to the conclusion it's all just way too hopeless? What did Esther do? Well, Esther asks that three days of prayers and fastings be made for her, and, and then she moves out in faith. Well, what was her faith based on? Wasn't her nation enslaved? Where did her faith come from? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Now, we're going to end up reading quite a bit here as we work through it. But we're just trying to get the image of her faith and what our faith can be. That's 
That's right. <laughs> Little sidebar. I won't take long on this. Just so, if if your phone rings, I understand completely. I went to the dentist last Thursday morning, and out of courtesy, I put my phone on do not disturb. And on Saturday night, Linda's asking, why aren't you answering your phone? <laughs> Do not disturb is not necessarily a good thing. It can be bad. <laughs> All right, moving on. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 11.6. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Drop down to verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, and dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky and the multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. These folks listed in Hebrews 11 had some great trials in their lives, but they also had some great victories. Isn't that what we desire, to be victorious in our walk with Christ? Is the New Testament still being written? I believe so. I believe that it's still being written. And one day we'll all be sitting by the river of life and you know people will be talking about the things that we did. Because it's going to be the small choices that we make and the cumulative effect that's going to bring glory and honor to God. Uh, and let's drop down to verse 32. And what more shall I say, for the time would fail to fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, <clears throat> quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in tune, were tempted, were slain with a sword, they were wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. What does verse 39 say? And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. <clears throat> I read the promise as the indwelling Holy Spirit, the great enabler. They accomplished these things through their faith only. How much more should we, who have received the indwelling presence of God, be getting done? Hebrews chapter 12, picking up in verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Where did Esther's strength and confidence come from? Based on her available resources. Well, that being the case, how much stronger should we be? Verse 4. You have not yet resisted the bloodshed striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? And we should be aware of these chastenings of the Lord, and fear should fall upon us if we are no longer being chastened. When you know you're doing wrong and you've come up to some sort of justification for it and it no longer bothers you, well, the Lord is no longer chastening you. And what is your status in the family of God at that time? 
Verse 8. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, and you are illegitimate and not sons, there, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we are the chosen of God. We are the sons of God himself. We have the power to do what Christ did in his life, to overcome the carnal man and walk on this planet as spiritual creatures and please the Father. Well, are there any evidences that this is true? Well, you'll have to look back into your life a little bit. Maybe look over the past five years. Do you see God working quietly in the background, slowly changing your heart and changing your mind and even your attitudes about what is right and wrong? One thing we should not do is get impatient. The Lord works in us and through us. Slow and steady changes are the lasting changes. But most of us have the hot now mentality. <clears throat> we want the quick fixes without the hassles. Even when I buy glue, I, I want the one that sets up in 10 minutes, not three hours. How about concrete? The fast and easy patch. But those types of fixes don't last. It is the slow and steady fixes that are permanent. That is why when we break an arm or a leg, we have to wear a cast for so long to make sure the fix is permanent. Much like our growth and training as a Christian, it needs to be slow and steady. Now Luke 6 and 40 says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Well, isn't that what verse 11 said? Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful? Well, nevertheless, afterwards it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now I see a spiritual parallel in the military in becoming an effective Christian. All services have a boot camp a testing ground, a training period. Three main things they work on. Your physical training so you can endure hardship. Your mental training to help you to be able to overcome and adapt to changing situations. And training in the use of various weapons so you can successfully engage the enemy. So are there spiritual parallels to this? The physical body, Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Living a life tuned into physical things will only lead to death. But overcoming the body to live a spiritual life, pleasing to God, brings life everlasting. Now, seeing this in your mind's eye is one thing. You know, Brother Steve can get up here and... Uh, do a little rabble rousing and get you fired up and rah 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 shish goomba but you know when you walk out the door do you remember it so it's that slow and steady progression of things learned layer upon layer upon there's, I think there's even a scripture verse that talks about verse upon verse line yeah upon line. line upon precept upon precept yeah building 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 that's what we do and it's going to be a process that's slow and permanent. The ability to, to reason, 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past. Without the ability to rightly divide the truth, we are left to be vulnerable to every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. We have to be aware of that. And correctly using the word of God to accomplish his will. 2 Timothy chapter 2. <coughs> 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 
I was thinking at some point there was going to be a moment when I was going to slow down a little bit, but I'm starting to wonder. The uh, communion meditation was pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, the uh, second hour that we had there for a minute or two. I have to rebuke some of the younger guys for going over. I didn't know I was going to have to rebuke Steve. That's your spousal unit sitting right next to you. Second Timothy. I know. Them of your own household. <laughs> All right. Good choice. Um, Second Timothy 3, 2 through 7. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, disobedient. I'm sorry. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth being a mile off target on the scriptures. How effective would you be if you just shared what you thought that the Bible said and not what God wanted to be taught? We are refined by the things that we face and overcome. Now those young guys that stood in the early morning light and faced the obstacle course each day, and if you've never seen one of these things, it can be intimidating. Everything is made out of telephone poles. So it goes up and up and up and up. And you're thinking, well, how on earth are you supposed to climb up that thing? Well, you end up doing it. But there's always those moments when you're thinking, I'm going to fall. Because thousands of Marines have been climbing up these things. Those telephone poles are not like you know, got rough edges where you got some grip. They're polished, smooth. They are, I can't say that. I was trying to think of a good way to talk about being very slippery. And I almost slipped and said something that I used to say in the Marine Corps years and years ago. And I thought, no, 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 I don't say that anymore. Especially during ice storm, super slippery. Yeah, ice storm, super slippery, yeah. You know, so here you are trying to, and they're big and round. I mean, they're not telephone. They're big and round, and your arms won't go all the way around them, and you're supposed to grab a hold of this and then swing your leg up and then somehow climb up and spin, and you've got to keep going up this thing and then down the other side. So anyway, the guys that were facing that early in the morning, uh, they were not rewarded for uh, just standing there looking at the obstacle course. You're rewarded when you finish the obstacle course. You'll forgive me at some point in your life. I'm going to digress for a minute. <clears throat> the other day, I walked between the television and Linda, and she said something like, did you ever do that? So I looked at her and said, do what? And she said, did you ever have to kill anybody when you were in the Marine Corps? Mm -hmm. I said, no. Took about two more steps. Well, did Bob ever kill anybody when he was in the Marine Corps? No. 23 years of service in the Marine Corps. I never had to kill anybody. But what was I being trained to do for 23 years? As my drill instructor put it, we're not here to teach you how to die for your country. We are here to teach you how to make that other blankety, blankety, blank, 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 die for his country. Yes. Never fired a shot in anger in 23 years. So does that mean I was unsuccessful? No. 
Marines are constantly training. We train with other countries, their military, Koreans, Filipinos, Norwegians, all over the world. Marines train with other forces, preparing for any type of battle that will come along. In the logistics field, the thing that I was in, we had to prepare for mass, cas mass casualties. So when you're in a training exercise and you're sitting in you know, this metal box with all this electronic equipment and some kid walks in and, and hands you a slip of paper and you look at it and it said, you know, 1st Platoon, 2nd Marine, 2nd uh, Battalion, 2nd Marine Division, wiped out entirely. Track vehicles all over the place. No problem. You have to start doing the logistics to recover equipment, get medical personnel there, evacuate them, resupply the ammunition that was expended during the conflict, resupplying water and food because, you know, they got to eat and drink, you know, even while the battle's going on. You're doing all these things and people are yelling at you as more things are coming in. Other locations and guys putting all this stuff on maps, marking it off and what happened. And you're jotting all this stuff down and firing off orders just as fast as you can. That's the kind of stuff that I did. But I never had to fire a shot in anger. But what about the Christian? Do you have to kill somebody? Yes, you do. You got to kill yourself. I was going to say put to death, but I think kill is a little more effective. Makes it more real here. You've got your life before you, your old man who's living with you and in you, and you need to be putting him to death by the small daily choices that you make to bring glory to God. If I stayed the grumpy gunny as a Christian and said, well, when I come to church, I'm just going to be a really nice guy and you guys are going to like me. But every day when I walk out into the world and places that I go, I'm a very sour, uh, negative, uh, browbeating type individual. What does that accomplish? That isn't what Christ came to teach us to do. He came to change us. He came to help us make those daily choices to put that old guy to death so that your light would shine and you would glorify him. In Galatians chapter 5, <clears throat> let me see if I can recover from that. Galatians chapter 5, picking up in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, this is quite a laundry list. Every one of us could have every one of these things. Or maybe you'll have some and I'll have some. Don't know. Lord knows. But he's going to be working on changing you to get these things out of your life. But you have to go along with the plan. You have to be involved in the training. You have to layer upon layer, precept upon precept, verse upon verse, and start applying them in the situations that come up in your life. And one day you'll look back and you'll say, well, a lot of those things that I used to be bothered by just don't bother me anymore because you're changing daily through the Word of God. Not of yourselves, but the Holy Spirit working with the Scriptures that you willingly volunteer to hear and seek out and ask questions about Bible studies that you participate in, you're constantly growing and developing into a new person. If you gave up smoking and drinking when you became a Christian, does it still have power over you? 
Do you still crave those things? Well, I can tell you as a smoker and drinker, for me, the answer is no. I don't have any interest in those things. Well, one day, anger, envy, or wrath will no longer have power over you either. We, have, we are the chosen of God. He has given us the power to overcome. And we have more strength than the orphan girl Esther had. And look what she did. For time's sake, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, is, isn't that the ultimate goal, to become like Christ? Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. That's more than just a trite saying. That's your daily life. Steve was talking about becoming a friend of God. A man after God's own heart. Well, how does that happen? By walking with him daily. Making those small choices that he would find pleasing. Changing your life totally over to living for Christ. Good job, Dan. <clears throat> In Matthew 5, 38 through 48, we won't, you can turn there if you wish, but the bottom line is Jesus said to turn the other cheek, not give a right cross. It may not be right or fair according to this world standards for someone to uh, take the shirt off your back, but Jesus said to give him your coat also. It may be wrong according to this world's standards for someone to have you perform labor for free, but Jesus said to double it. Do we trust in the Lord's methods? Or do we just agree with them mentally as a good standard, but don't actually put them into practice? Esther actually put her life in the hands of the Lord and trusted that the prayers and fasting would reach God's ears. I would encourage you this week to look at the events in your life and ask yourself if you've responded to them as the Lord would have you have done, or did you employ the world's routine response to the issue? You're going to have to decide what that looks like. Remember, it is our daily choices that demonstrate who we are and whose we are. The cumulative effect of multiple godly choices it was, is what's going to change you and bring you closer to God and bring him glory. Changing our mindset to respond as the Lord would have done is going to take some time. It takes time to learn. It takes faith and sometimes courage to apply it. And we also have to be patient and not grow weary waiting to see the fruits of it. Are you going to accomplish some great thing for the Lord? some great battle that is going to be fought? Or can you, for 23 years, do your best of your ability for God, core, and country and walk away with a successful career? Can you live your life daily choosing the things for God without ever doing any million-man army defense or, you know, Create something great for God? Can you just live a normal Christian life and be successful? Absolutely. Just something to think about. Throughout the scriptures, there's many examples of average people doing great things for God, including the young girl, Esther. We are no different than them. We are just living in a different time period. I am also confident that we have all come into the kingdom for such a time as this, and we are serving together in this time. We have challenges before us, but Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, so we should have confidence that others have run the same challenges as we have. Keep a positive attitude, press forward, and remember what Jesus said in Revelations 2.10. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat>